If you're familiar with my taste in games, I think it's pretty clear to anyone I grew up on Nintendo systems for most of my life. The only real break away from that tradition that I've had in my life is when I got a PlayStation 3 from my uncle when I was about 15. I didn't end up touching many of those games though for whatever reason. I just wasn't really interested in going outside of my mostly Nintendo-centered bubble. But obviously there are a lot of games out there and I have some catching up to do. So cut to September 11th of 2021 and I had an excuse to go to a local retro game shop and while browsing the vast selection of games strung along the walls, I saw the PlayStation 3 Uncharted trilogy for under $20. I don't own a PlayStation 4 or 5 so I don't have access to the Nathan Drake collection for those wondering. But I figured that was an enticing opportunity to try out a new series on a console that I already owned. So I figured, why not chronicle my experiences getting into an acclaimed series that I don't know a ton about? I've heard these games be described as playable action movies, a sort of Indiana Jones-esque treasure hunting, quippy, bombastic third-person shooter action series. Funnily enough, I actually don't have any experience playing any Naughty Dog game, period. I haven't played a Crash Bandicoot, Jack, Uncharted, or Last of Us game, all of which intrigued me quite a lot, especially that last one. And I want to start off on the right foot, Drake's Fortune appears to be the turning point for Naughty Dog where they started taking their games in a more narratively focused direction. Naughty Dog also appears to have a high reputation for developing games that push the visual standards of their generations. For example, Crash Bandicoot still looks stylistically appealing even all these years later on PlayStation 1 despite the obvious improvements that have been made since with the polygon count and the shaders and whatnot. Naughty Dog also appear to have lately been working to push the standards of storytelling in games regarding the acting and mocapping presentation. They also have a lot of prestige and brownie points, releasing a lot of critically acclaimed and commercially successful games. Needless to say, I'm quite excited. I have a pair of disclaimers to throw out there before I get into the video proper. So firstly, as previously established, I'm playing the game on PlayStation 3, so the PlayStation 4 remasters will not be accounted for in my reviews. If they make significant changes or fixes on the gameplay side of things, I will try and note it, but overall I'm just reviewing them on PlayStation 3, so just keep that in mind. Secondly, I made a mistake when capturing because I'm an idiot, so my PlayStation 3 was set to limited RGB range when my capture card was sampling full RGB range, so the settings were mismatched and as a result the footage doesn't look exactly right, and of course because I'm an idiot, I only noticed this right after I recorded the entire game. I went and re-recorded the cutscenes in the proper settings, but doing the same for the gameplay wouldn't feel right considering this is meant to be a chronicling of my very first experiences with these games. I'll be sure to avoid making this mistake in the future games, sorry about that. As a result, gameplay footage will look slightly off, but I will avoid making this mistake in the future. So yeah. But with that out of the way, let's waste no more time and let's get into the 2007 classic, Uncharted Drake's Fortune. Although weird. I thought these games were about a dude named Nathan Drake, but <laughs> I guess Naughty Dog just really wanted to pay tribute to the rising star musician of the time. <laughs> Speaking of which, Drake, you're a gamer, right? Yeah. You played Fortnite with Ninja that one time. What did you play this game on when it came out? Controller. <laughs> this is stupidest joke. Oh my god. <laughs> Hand it over. Well now, you told me not to move. Looks like you're gonna have to come get it. Uh, they come so Uncharted takes us on a journey with the cunning, sarcastic, and knowledgeable explorer known as Nathan Drake. Who could have figured out such a little known fact? I don't know, I just sort of have an intuition for this sort of thing. Beginning the game, we start on a boat in the middle of the Pacific along with our reporter acquaintance Elena Fisher. They manage to dig up the coffin of Sir Francis Drake filled with nothing but his journal, which later proves to have some helpful clues for finding El Dorado, an ancient city of gold. No time to think about that though because pirates! After struggling to figure out the controls and getting f***ed up pretty badly at first, we're saved by Nate's good old partner in crime, Victor Sullivan. Nathan informs Sully, and by extension the audience, that Francis Drake's journal contains clues to leading them to El Dorado. Sully makes it clear he's on this journey for the money, as we later come to find out he is in hefty amounts of debt. I guess he simply wanted to relive what it's like to be in his 20s after going to college. After some charming back and forth, our two male leads decide it's in their best interest to leave Elena out on this one so as to avoid luring any other treasure hunters to what they believe will be El Dorado. After swiftly maneuvering through this ancient temple, they come to realize that there's no El Dorado to be found here, but later they find a gigantic German U-boat with a missing page from Drake's diary containing a clue to finding where Nate believes the Spanish hid El Dorado. Until, oops! Sully gets capped by an old arch enemy of his, Gabriel Roman. Thankfully, Nate's clumsiness is his savior here, as the old torpedo he found in the u boat gives him a small window of time to narrowly escape with Elena once she catches up with him. Right off the bat, the Indiana Jones vibes were immediately set in stone. 
We got our young and acrobatic 20-something going through a jungle area exploring an ancient temple rigged with traps and puzzles until they find the next clue to finding a greater treasure. Unfortunately, the bad guys got there right as they did and swiftly take said clue, but before they can get away with anything else, our protagonist is able to escape in a thrilling chase sequence that eventually leads us to safety via plane. And this isn't a negative by any means, I think it would be impossible for the folks at Naughty Dog to not have fully intended to imitate that type of story. The appeal of this series, as I understand it, is to make essentially a playable blockbuster action movie. I just didn't expect to feel those vibes so soon, but I think that's also a really good thing. It lets you immediately know what you're getting into and if you like that sort of thing. And I love me some Indiana Jones. I used to play the hell out of the two Lego Indiana Jones games on the Wii as a kid, and I certainly enjoy action movies a fair deal nowadays. Nathan and Elena end up getting ambushed and need to parachute onto the nearby island, where Nate endures gunfight after gunfight after gunfight with the henchman of an old enemy of his, Eddie Raja. He manages to find the crash site of the plane and recollects the missing page of Drake's diary. Nate maneuvers his way through the old fortress where Elena is exploring until getting captured by Eddie Raja's cronies after distracting them from Elena's presence. Elena comes to Nate's rescue, however, and the two of them endure an onslaught of vehicle escape sequences together before making it into an abandoned customs house. There are two big conversations between them in between these moments, the first being where Nathan says that the two of them should play it safe and leave the treasure be, where Elena denies and says that they may as well try and find it since it's not far out of the way for them. The second big conversation is where Elena acknowledges a legend she heard about the cursed ink and treasure and a supernatural feeling of having an entire colony just disappear spontaneously, which Nathan laughs off. After working through the customs house, they come to find out that <gasps> Sully is alive? They both question if he's working for Roman or only helping to survive. Nate insists that Sully would never betray them and the goal is now to regroup with him. Elena drops a camera crossing a rickety bridge and Nathan begins to make it clear that he's connecting with Elena quite a bit through how concerned he sounds when she's in danger. And how when they come to meet up with Sully again, Nate gives her just about all the credit for being the reason he's currently alive to meet Sully again to begin with. Sully also reveals that he lived because of Francis Drake's diary slowing the bullet down okay normally i don't like to point stuff like this out because it's just to me it's so nitpicky to the point where it really doesn't matter personally because i don't have any trouble ignoring stuff like this but the way this was set up is kind of weird now the diary saving sully to me that's just that's a little silly no matter how you slice it but i didn't get the impression this game was going for like a super serious and dramatic and realistic type of story so i don't really mind that much at all because the game's clearly understanding what it's trying to be and it's not taking itself too seriously what is confusing to me is that nate gives sully the diary because i don't know why actually sully's the only one worried about exploring the u-boat in the amazon i feel like it would make way more sense for him to just ask nate to give it to him in preparation for the worst case scenario nate isn't worried about getting the diary wet he just swam through gross and old temple water right before this i just found that to be kind of silly Sorry, I skimmed over one small detail just before where one of Eddie Rogers' men was killed by a trap that some other group must have set very recently given what the trap was made out of. After digging through the big ol' sanctuary and some catacombs, Nate overhears a conversation between Raja and Roman, which <laughs> sounds like the name of a sitcom now that I say it out loud. The former of which is laid off by the latter due to his lack of progress in capturing Nate. I have another nitpicky complaint about the bad guys in this game. There are areas where Nathan Drake needs to parkour through incredibly dangerous set pieces and solve puzzles that are only solvable through using Francis Drake's diary. And somehow, without fail, every single area, there are just human enemies f***ing hanging out, just chilling there. I can sort of buy it for above ground areas because they could have just used a helicopter, which is clearly a resource that both of the main villains have. but. For places like the catacombs and especially the treasure vault, I do not buy this shit at all. Nathan had to rotate all these symbols in the correct orientation to find the treasure vault, and Eddie Raja and the boys just f***ing show up ahead of Nathan somehow. Was there a back door? How did they get here before we did? Let's use the secret entrance. After thorough digging through the mausoleum, Elena and Nate encounter Eddie Raja once again. Nate also becomes devastated seeing Francis Drake's corpse realizing his hunt for treasure ended in failure. But there's little time for that because Eddie's pissed scared of these things and you work together to briefly fight them off before, oops, Eddie's gone. Elena once again proves to be of great help as the two of them lock the creatures out for the time being. After a frankly terrifying exploration of the bunker below, Nate is met with the realization that the treasure is cursed and Francis Drake wasn't attempting to keep the treasure all to himself but was trying to keep its curse from spreading further beyond the island. Nate is met by Roman once again as he captures Elena. Nate is then left to fight off both Roman's men as well as who we now know are the Spaniards who made contact with the treasure. Nate meets back up with Sully at the sanctuary and the two of them catch up with Roman and the boys who of course thought ahead of time and now have them at gunpoint. Navarro convinces Roman to peek inside El Dorado and get a good whiff of that nice evil Incan curse aroma. I wonder why that isn't a scented candle flavor. <laughs> 
Turns out Navarro was playing Roman the whole time, and turns out to be the true final bad guy. Nathan gives chase, and after a frankly, let's to put it lightly, frustrating final boss, Nathan's wits and ingenuity, or maybe just Navarro's stupidity, end up being the best means of brute force, and sinks the cursed treasure with Navarro along with it. Sully drives back up with a fat stack of gold from the pirates, and they all celebrate a job well done and a successful and profitable voyage. Roll credits. In spite of the nitpicks that I do have with the story, I definitely found the story to be the motivator for me throughout this game. The gameplay was just sort of okay, it alternates between being pretty impressive and enjoyable to frustrating and tedious. But I found myself enjoying the story most out of everything in the game. It was one of those things where cutscenes felt like a reward because of the charming dialogue and the captivating characters. I think a lot of the reason that was the case is the presentation. Now, the graphics have certainly aged quite a bit, and whenever you're moving around it's pretty evident this game was made over a decade ago. There's an abundance of screen tearing, the motion blur looks gross, and we've certainly come a long way since 2007 in terms of resolution, frame rate, and clarity. And I think this is the Nathan Drake Collection's ace in the hole if you're new to the series. The visual upgrade was quite a major one, and I think Uncharted 1 makes the clearest case of just how major it was. But the cutscenes and environments on the PlayStation 3 version still look great to me in my opinion. When you're allowed to just kind of sit still and look around, I think the game can look stunning in some areas. Not to mention the animation during cutscenes are an insane jump in detail from the previous generation of consoles, especially in terms of facial muscles and details. I think they look great even today. One thing about Uncharted's presentation that's aged even better in my opinion is the acting and performances. Nolan North fits Nathan Drake damn well, and hearing Nate think out loud were some of my favorite parts of the gameplay dialogue. His calls for when grenades are nearby or when new enemies show up were very helpful when I was focusing on something else. Emily Rose as Elena was pretty good. I didn't adore her performance, but I think her and Nolan's chemistry does a lot to make Nathan and Elena's relationship progression feel very natural. Considering how this relationship appears to be the central emotional core of these stories, I think that does a lot of heavy lifting to make the story as much of a highlight as it is. My favorite voice in this game is actually Richard McGonagall as Sully. He has a very soothing and friendly aura about him. I don't think I'd want anyone else's voice to do the job other than McGonagall's. The rest of the performances were solid, I was never taken out of the story by awkward delivery of any kind, and I think this game clearly had a hand in elevating standards for acting and story delivery in video games. The only voice related thing that I found irritating was the enemy dialogue recycling so frequently, but that's far from an issue exclusive to this game, Resident Evil 4 is very much in the same camp and it came out just two years before this game. The three main leads are all very likable characters, and they're the reason the story was as engaging as it was for me. Nathan Drake is a great fit for an incredibly skilled and acrobatic explorer, and I love how real the dialogue between him and everybody else feels in these games. I think it's even better in Uncharted 2, but the conversations between all the characters in these games feel very natural. There wasn't a point where the reactions of a character felt really jarring or exaggerated for the sake of easy drama. Everybody talks like how real human beings do. For example, Nate and Sully are naturally both peeved at each other for what happened when Sully got shot, but they don't make any contrived conflict between them for an extended amount of time, they just take the time to get mad at each other briefly, both for justifiable reasons, and they just put it aside realizing it won't do them any good in their current situation. A similar thing goes for Nathan and Elena's relationship, they start off pretty disconnected and don't feel super comfortable or trustworthy with each other. But with more life and death situations and teamwork opportunities, they slowly grow to be more interested in each other's safety and talk more openly with one another. I really enjoy how authentic it feels, outside of a few awkward lines of dialogue here and there. What the hell was that? Anti-aircraft fire? This is so not cool! I found the story to be well told. Considering the tone I envisioned them going for, I think the writing is nailing the light and fun action movie vibe through how sarcastic the main leads are and the classic Indiana Jones formula type story works perfectly for what this game is trying to be. Now, the gameplay of Uncharted Drake's Fortune is a pretty mixed bag if you ask me. I do want to make a disclaimer that I'm not experienced with shooters, period. Most of my experience would be with the Zelda games through their bow and arrow or hookshot aiming mechanics and Resident Evil 4, which I only really played to the credits about a month ago. I'm far from a sharpshooter on any shooter, period, and I want to try and separate any mad cuz bad biases from interfering with my opinion. I also want to throw in here that as of the time I'm writing this, I've played about 4 hours of Uncharted 2 and I do not have the same issues with the gunplay in that game that I have in this game. It's also worth noting that I played on hard difficulty, and my experience with games or campaigns that allow you to choose your difficulty level, the max difficulty is usually frustrating, and I tend to find the setting just below max to offer a decent balance of challenging but fully doable with perseverance. Now, all of that said, I found the gunfighting segments of Drake's Fortune to be far and away the biggest source of irritation in this game, and were easily the part I think is in need of the most updating for future games. 
where I think Resident Evil 4 is fully aware of the limitations of the controllers of its era and uses the limitations of stick-only aiming to create tension whilst giving the player full capability to handle the obstacles and enemies the game is throwing at you, I feel like Drake's Fortune is doing very little to account for the inherent limitations of aiming with sticks only. Disappointingly, despite allowing you to aim your reticle for throwing grenades using motion controls, you are not allowed that same luxury for shooting for whatever reason. In fact, apparently none of the Uncharted games allow you to use gyro aiming in any release of them, despite it being built into the DualShock 4. I find this immensely disappointing, as gyro aiming does a great deal to improve aiming on controllers. For Drake's Fortune on PlayStation 3, I am willing to give this game a pass, but it also has these really tacky waggle to win parts like leaning your controller back and forth to balance on a log or shaking wildly to get rid of the beasts. For 2007, I suppose it's not fair to expect motion control aiming options, but I think it would easily enhance these games in a future release if Uncharted 2 and 3 handle shooting segments the same as this game does. What I mean by that is, the goal in the Uncharted games is to aim quickly and dispatch enemies quickly as a result. The more accuracy available, the better. In Resident Evil 4, by contrast, the goal is to manage resources effectively and to survive more comfortably. Thus, shooting carefully is vastly more important than it is to dispose of enemies quickly. You use your guns as a last resort when you have no option but to use your most valuable resources. To some, the Wii release of Resident Evil 4 can lose some tension because of how much easier it is to aim and shoot accurately using the Wii remote. As a result, I think some of that appeal could be lost because of the increased accuracy. Drake's Fortune, on the other hand, I don't think this would be the case. I don't see improved accuracy doing anything but making the combat feel better to play. As it is now, the aiming control feels stiff and jolty, just like most every other stick-only aiming scheme I've experienced. Minute adjustments always feel like a crapshoot, either resulting in the desired result or overshooting, and it just doesn't feel ideal compared to even the bow aiming mechanics of Breath of the Wild nowadays. The guns all feel pretty much the same. I never found myself connecting to one gun over another, it just sort of felt like I took whatever gun had the most ammo around me. A major reason that was the case for me is how the enemies in this game are bullet sponges, and the sound design and rumble just really didn't make the shots feel satisfying. In Resident Evil 4, every gun has a different sound and feeling when taking a shot, making each gun feel unique in such a way that I knew what guns I liked using and which ones I did not. The guns in Drake's Fortune don't feel that way. Like I said, I basically only picked up the guns with the most ammo nearby. Doing something as simple as taking out one enemy can feel incredibly annoying because sometimes you just shoot them in the chest five times with f***ing handguns and somehow they just keep standing and firing back. There's also very little leniency for getting attacked, leading you to basically need to sit there behind cover and wait for Nathan to heal and for the enemies to sprout up behind their cover. That's another thing too, most of these battle arenas end up necessitating that most fights play out the exact same way because it never feels like there's a good situation to advance to new spots for cover because you're so often surrounded on most sides of you that moving around feels like a bad idea most of the time. Thus making the stick only aiming issues normally being at the forefront of at least my mind while I was playing. My favorite encounters in this game were the cursed monster chases because the tension is heightened with these freaky things chasing you and attempting to bite your neck off. You also are encouraged to run and gun when encountering them, so poor aiming doesn't manage to be nearly as big a deal. Not to mention, this enemy type only has melee options, so they have to get close to you in order to do anything, and shooting something directly in front of you makes for a much easier shot. It's for these reasons that these encounters are my favorite, because there's no waiting for enemies to jump out of their cover or waiting for four different enemy firing cycles to stop. Unfortunately, Drake's Fortune can frequently throw you into nothing but back-to-back -back cover shootouts for upwards of half an hour at a time, and let's just say I found it to get boring and frustrating more than it ended up being rewarding. All of this culminated in what very well could be one of the worst final bosses I've experienced. Navarro is a main villain that you really don't know anything about other than that he wants to sell El Dorado, which Gabriel Roman assumedly wanted to do anyway. He has no personal connection to Nathan, if anything Gabriel Roman did, cause he already established a history with Sully and Nathan regularly talks shit to him in the interactions they have and is hostile towards him considering he shot Sully. While we're on the topic, this twist just doesn't make any sense to me cause it changes practically nothing about the story. The way I see it, the best twists or surprises should seek to make the audience think of previous events or characters in a new light that can give those moments or characters even more meaning on repeat viewings or playthroughs. Navarro taking center stage doesn't change anything about the forces you're up against, it doesn't create any realizations or new meanings behind previous scenes, and worst of all, you could very easily rewrite Navarro out of the story and it changes essentially nothing. Roman isn't an amazing villain, but I think he'd make a much better fit for a final boss when it comes to the personal stakes and buildup. Navarro is such a nothing character, we know he lived in the slums at some point in his life, he naturally is manipulative considering he plays Roman, and I don't even know what else there is to say about him. Other than the fact that, oh my god, I hate his final boss so f***ing much. 
I was stuck on this boss battle for half an hour, and most of it was struggling through this incredibly rigid and unforgiving first half. This encounter is pretty terrible, especially when it comes to testing what you've learned throughout the game. So, Navarro is front and center, so I think anybody would assume that you could attack him considering he's shooting at you, right? Apparently, that's not what the folks at Naughty Dog wanted you to do, because you can't do shit to him, despite him assuming the exact same position as every other human enemy you fought in this game. You can't shoot him when he's exposed, you can't evade his laser sight, even though every other enemy with one gets shaken off by mashing the circle button, which just flat out fails here. You shouldn't even think about trying to melee him. Doing anything but exactly what the game is asking you to do will result in immediate death. What fun. I think this was where I truly got my first really potent and strong taste of the rigid way Naughty Dog wants you to go about some set pieces in these games. What you are supposed to do, apparently, is to shoot everybody except Navarro, because that makes perfect sense. You're meant to do so while upwards of four enemies will be firing at you at once while you hide behind boxes that break very, very quickly, not even accounting for Navarro's shots instantly killing you just holy shit, this boss battle f***ing sucks. You can't even begin brawling with Navarro until you take this exact path behind the boxes because f*** you, we said so. Needless to say, this boss battle f***ing sucks. Not helping the combat is that the environments through most of the game consists of incredibly drab and samey color palettes, and that the game is recycling the same motifs and even the same areas throughout the fairly short runtime. There wasn't really a point where I felt visually refreshed through any of the environments, and it doesn't do this game any favors. There also wasn't a point where reaching the end of a shootout ever felt rewarding or satisfying, it just kind of feels like a sigh of relief that the not so fun part of the game was over. Or so I thought, because what do you know, here's another shootout immediately after. Suffice it to say, I didn't really enjoy the gunplay in Drake's Fortune. I didn't hate it most of the time, but I also didn't really like it. The puzzles also really weren't that good. They all essentially are solved by just looking at Francis Drake's journal, and that's pretty much it. Off the top of my head, I remember four notable puzzles, and all of them were solved because you look at the journal and then do a thing to line up with the journal. The problem isn't using the journal, it's that the journal is giving you the solutions instead of clues that will lead you to the solutions. While we're talking about things that don't require tons of thought, I thought the climbing sections were fine. Obviously, they're not mechanically rich in any way, but in terms of establishing the scale and spectacle of the area you're traversing, I think they can be visually interesting enough to not feel like a waste of time. My favorite part of the gameplay was just kind of exploring the landscapes and looking around. As I said before, when you're standing still, the game looks pretty great, and I found myself always looking around for the hidden treasure trinkets throughout the game. I only managed to get around half of them, which makes me wonder how I missed so many when the game is so linear. I feel like I thoroughly explored most every area, but evidently not if I missed 26 out of the 60. The trinkets themselves are neat, I guess, but it mostly just felt rewarding to have the intrinsic value of having the developers wink at you saying, hey, observant one, here's a cute little knickknack for your trouble. The action set pieces were also pretty fun. My favorite one was the truck chase and the sprint across the crumbling wooden structure in the temple. The first jet ski segment was pretty fun. The second one wasn't because of how awkwardly you have to try and aim around the obstacles in your way, otherwise you're just gonna die. It also really highlights just how shaky and poor the aiming is in this game. These segments were the points in the game that I felt most like the best realization of that Indiana Jones fantasy I imagine these games are going for. The music was pretty forgettable, the biggest exception being the main theme, which I think is a fantastic fit for the series. I really like the song that plays during the scene where Nathan finds a projector. It's fittingly spooky and really oppressive sounding. I don't think the game is really going for like a necessarily super catchy and memorable lineup of tunes, and that's fine, I just usually like it when there could be a balance of immersive atmosphere and catchy earworms. With those terms in mind, the music was fine, but I doubt I'll listen to these tracks outside of the game. And I think I'm running out of things to talk about, so I guess it's best to start wrapping up. Uncharted Drake's Fortune is a decent game that is a pretty evident example of being the game that walked so the rest of Naughty Dog's narratively driven games could run. I think the pacing is great at the start and then slows down for too long and evidently the game is running out of things to give you, before suddenly getting back on track and making the story at the very least more gripping and interesting. The characters are the most compelling part of this game and the story. The dialogue has an even tone to it, and it makes the series what it is, and the relationships between the characters are the highlight of this game. The gameplay is pretty hit and miss, with the gunplay frequently being boring or annoying, especially because of how many shootouts can be encountered back to back, and the spectacle and climbing sections were just okay. The visuals during gameplay can show their age, but the animations and facial details are wonderful for 2007, and Naughty Dog were clearly elevating the standard level of detail for games of that era. It's a game that I find would be mostly worth playing to experience the story and to be up to speed for future games. After playing a good chunk of Uncharted 2, I can comfortably say that this series makes significant improvements from Uncharted 1 to 2, and I'm eager to see what awaits me through the rest of the series. Join me next time, I will be back soon with a look at Uncharted 2 Among Thieves.
among thieves. What I've heard some declare is one of the best games ever made, at least that seemed to be a common sentiment when it came out in 2009. Needless to say, I'm very excited, and if what little I have played of it is of any indication, it will be a great time. So thank you all for watching a dive into Uncharted Drake's Fortune, and have a great rest of your day. Drake. You used to call me on my cell phone.